Oh, I want to just thank God for this day, and I want to again thank you for all being here. Um, this study where we're working on is uh, the Gospel of John, and some of you may be familiar with this letter. This letter was written after the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and John didn't really need to repeat what the other um, letters were written about because he felt that he had something else to talk about, and he was talking about more importantly than the other three Gospels, and that was eternal life. This is a fast-paced letter, and John really wants to get to the heart of what Jesus is, and that Jesus is truly the Son of God, and that he came here to redeem us and to offer us into eternal life. This letter that I share with people, this Gospel of John, is what I believe is a love letter. A love letter to everyone who wants to hear. And a love letter, how do we read a love letter? We read a love letter carefully, and sometimes we read it twice. Sometimes we read between the lines, and we ponder and we think about it. And I think that's what we really want to do with the Gospel, or the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, is to read them, and read them carefully, and allow God to speak through us, because the, rich, the Scriptures actually are the testimony. And in our passage where we are, we are moving quickly, and we are in chapter 5 of John, and we're going to start in the chapter uh, 5, verse 30, where Jesus is being challenged by the church leaders about who he is and his authority, and he says then that he is a, he, there is a witness to who he is. Now, all of this is taking place up at this point. Remember that um, in a very short period of time, John the Baptist had or inaugurated Jesus and said, this truly is the Lamb of God, and Jesus went out. And if you recall in the passages in chapter 2, he goes up to Canaan, and there's the wedding feast, and Jesus changes water into wine. And I think it's very symbolic there about this is possibly a symbol of how Jesus transforms us. He fills us with the Spirit, and then what comes out of us being filled with the Spirit then is the fruit. Then Jesus then moves on, he goes to the temple, back to Jerusalem, and he charges the Jews, the religious leaders, that they are not keeping a clean house, that they are defiling God's house. And he makes a scene and he throws things out, and upsets a lot of these Jewish leaders. He then goes back up to uh, Cana area, the Galilean area, and he creates a couple miracles. He heals a nobleman's son from a distance, who he didn't even see and he touched. Um, he then goes on and he heals more people. He comes back down to Jerusalem. And where this text is speaking right now is at the Pool of Bethsaida. The Pool of Bethsaida, in recalling the scripture, was a place where people came to be healed and that the Spirit of God would stir the waters, and those who would come to the waters and get in the waters would be then healed. But this man, who lay inside the water, was there 38 years. Now, there were more than one that was there, and Jesus picks this man out. The man didn't ask to be healed. Jesus sought him out. Jesus does that. God does that. He seeks us out, even though we're not asking to even be healed. And yet he healed them. But he was doing it metaphorically to speak that he was healing the nation of Israel. He was going to give the opportunity for Israel to come back to God, to have a right relationship. Because the 38 years that this man was inflicted were the same 38 years that Israel wandered in the wilderness and that they were empty and void of God. So now this man gets up. He doesn't even thank Jesus and runs off and he goes to the temple. He goes to the temple and he starts telling all the Jewish leaders there that, oh, this man healed me. Well, the Jewish leaders got upset because they, that someone had violated sabbatical law, that they worked or healed on the Sabbath. And how dare this man do this? And who is this? So ironically, Jesus shows up at the temple. I mean, it was, I don't think it was by chance. I think Jesus was really following after his healing to see whether or not Israel or the Jewish people were really going to make a decision. So then they confronted him on who he is, and he tells them that he's equal with God. Well, now they're not concerned about whether or not that he broke the Sabbath, but now that he was professing to be God himself, God Almighty himself. Can you imagine how angry they were. Well, then Jesus goes on, and I will pick up here in verse 30, chapter 5, and Jesus says, I can do 
nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone test about myself, and the testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from men. But I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But... The testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me that the Father has sent me. The Father who sent me, he has testified of me. And you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his words abiding in you, for you do not believe him in whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is in these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in the name of my Father, and you do not receive me. If anyone comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe? When you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. Do you not think that I will accuse you before the, wit the Father? The one who accuses you is Moses in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would not believe me for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus is talking about a testimony here. He's actually talking about three, four witnesses. He's talking about the witness of John. He's talking about the witness of the Father, the Heavenly Father. He's talking about the witnesses of his work. And more importantly, the point that I'm going to get to and unpack here is he's talking about the witness of the Scriptures. That is, it's through the Scriptures that we truly can see what God is and who God is. Now, a testimony. What is a testimony? Each and every one of us here who has accepted Christ has a testimony. And the testimony is that of how God has transformed you and how he's changed your life and what it makes a difference in it. As Bill was sharing, that there's a testimony in each of us and how God has impacted our lives. And now a testimony has to be proven to say, well, I had God change my life and I used to be that way. And yet if someone doesn't come up alongside and say, I remember you and that's not who you are. There's that change. So Jesus is saying, listen, John the Baptist is a witness for me. He said he was set from before as a light and you went to look for him. You know the scriptures. You are waiting for me. John was a witness of me. And he said, I'm not the light, but he's the light. And to follow him. So John the Baptist became the first witness of Jesus Christ, that he is truly the Son of God. He goes on to say, you know, Jesus had no need to witness of himself, of his will was identical to the Father. You know, when we talk about the law, and that's where we really is. Jesus fulfills the law. And Moses gave us the law. If we break the law, we are judged. But there has to be a witness, isn't there? When we go to, in our country, we go to before the court, there are witnesses that have to testify to what we did. If you would turn to me with me to Deuteronomy chapter 17, in the sixth verse, and it says here, on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. I think this is very important here, that we realize the importance of multiple witnesses and the witness that one cannot die. Do you know something? As I studied this here, God can't take our life. 
cannot take our life or take us and make us die or cause us to die on his own. He says it cannot be one witness. And see, here's the, here's the triune, triune God. It is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bear witness unto one another. And they then hold us accountable. You see, God can't do it on his own. He had to have the Son be the witness to testify. He had to stand firm. So see the important. Jesus didn't need John to tell who he is. In this case, a self-witness would be a false witness because it would be implied he didn't need to distinguish between himself and the Father. John couldn't do that. Jesus did it himself through the Father. John the Baptist, you know, in 34, in 30, in verse 32, it says, there is another, and that is the Father, as is playing with the connection. How brightly the distinction between the person shines out here, that Jesus is illuminating the Father above himself. And you know that the witnesses, quote, this is, this is the Son's testimony of the Father's truth. In John 7, 28, it says, you both know me, and you knew where I'm from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him and he sent me. Jesus knows the Father intimately. And he's wanting that relationship for you to have that intimate relationship with the Father. It testifies to the full conscience of the part of the Son, even in the days of his humiliation on the cross. It testified of the Father and the righteousness of the Father. And thus he has cheered his spirit upon the cloud of the human oppression, which was already gathering around him. They were already condemning him. In verse 33 through 35, it says, You sent unto John to receive not testimony from man, but that ye might be saved. He's referring to him merely to aid your salvation. He is this burning light, John is, in this desert. This burning, shining light that is the great light of his day. Christ is never called by a humble word here applied to John as a light bearer. Willing for a season, that is, that till they saw that it pointed where that they were not prepared to go. To rejoice in this light. Rejoice in Jesus. There is a play of irony here. Irony, be referring to the hollow delight with which his testimony tickled them. John the Baptist's witness was valuable, but it wasn't adequate. John's witness certainly led some people to Christ, but it was unthinkable that Jesus should need to reply or rely on that witness. John's own witness is compared to the lamp, but he himself was not the light. Although he pointed to the light, they thought that John was the Messiah. They thought John the Baptist was there to deliver them. And yet he himself witnessed to the light. The purpose of all witness is said to be that people might be saved. That is our purpose of our witness, that we can bring others to Christ Jesus to be saved. He changed me. He moved me. He set me in a direction. And when I share that with others, I become a witness and a testimony that Christ is alive. I did not do this on my own works. I did not do this on my own account. So Jesus goes on to the next one, the witness of his works in thir verse 36. His teachings, the miracles that come from the Father. God gave him the authority. Remember he talked about that earlier in chapter 5? He says that God gave him the authority. He couldn't do it on his own. He had to do it for according to what the Father willed to be done. In verse 36, he says, I have greater witness, rather the witness that which is greater than I. The works bear witness of me. He's simply stating, simply not as miracles, nor as a miracle of mercy, but these miracles as he did them with a will and a power, a majesty and a grace manifested in his own. He, these miracles he was doing, he was testifying to everyone that truly he is God. No one can raise the dead. We talked about that. No one has life over death. Only God can do that. 
We talked about that it was through this process of a period of di dying that the Egyptians cleverly figured out that within three days they could raise someone from the dead. But four days. And yet, he's talking about raising dead. We talked about that last week, about the resurrection. Jesus is offering the resurrection of life. And he's offering the resurrection of life right now. He's offering the life of eternal life after we die. But the resurrection into new life comes by believing in him and receiving him and walking in that light. So he talks about resurrection. He hadn't raised anyone from the dead yet. But he was going to. He then speaks about the Father. The Father also testifies about him. And the Father himself has borne witness of me. Not referring probably to the voice of the baptism. Remember when John the Baptist anointed Jesus with water and the voice of heaven spoke and says, truly this is my son in whom I am well pleased and the spirit of God descended on him like a dove. I don't believe that all these people that were in this temple right now that were charging Jesus were there and heard this voice. So when Jesus was saying, you have not heard nor seen the father, what he's speaking about is that they knew the testimony of the Old Testament, the scriptures of the Old Testament, but they did not recognize Jesus as the character of God himself. Verse 38 says, not his word abiding in you, passing now from the witness to the testimony borne by him in the living oracles. In Acts 7, verse 37, let me read with you. This is the one Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking of him on Mount Sinai, and who was with our fathers, and he received the living oracles to pass on, unwillingly to be obedient. Both were alike strangers to their breasts, as is evidenced by their rejecting him, to whom all witness was born, continually rejecting God. In all the signs and wonders and miracles that he does, People today still rejecting God, rejecting Christ. Jesus next appeals to the testimony of his works. And he talks about pluralism here. And these are a special nature because the Father had commissioned them. It is for this reason that the witness of Jesus' works is greater than the witness of John's works. John was witnessing about the salvation that was to come. John the Baptist wasn't healing John the Baptist wasn't raising from the dead. John was just testifying of the one to come. Yet the testimony had fallen on unproductive soil. Although the Father had witnessed to Jesus, the hearers had not heard his voice or recognized his presence. I would have to ask you now, if Jesus was standing in front of you, would you be able to recognize him? Would you be able to recognize the Spirit of God in the manifestation of someone's life being changed by this word? Can you see him? Or have you blinded yourself with deceit and lies? A question you should ponder. Do you see Jesus? Will you see Jesus? The plain fact was that through unbelief of God's word, primarily the scriptures, they did not dwell in them. They knew the scriptures. They quoted them. They memorized the scriptures better than any one of us has ever memorized the scriptures. And yet they did not know God. How empty. How empty that could be. So it leads us into the fourth witness. This is the most important, as I said, as we unpack this. The scriptures point to him. But... Though the people say they believe the scriptures, they didn't believe him. They had him right before him. All of it being manifested, and they denied him. They argued with him. They even accused him. Stand back when you have someone next to you that starts accusing God. I don't want to be close to that. You know, because God is a just God. And people say, well, he's not. How can he be a loving God if he does all these things to people? He does these things because he's correcting us. He wants us to be obedient to his will. And there's a judgment we face. Whether you believe in God or not, 
this truth is real. And it will still be real after you're dead and gone. These scriptures have been tested, they've been tried, and they are true. And the more man tries to figure out or discredit the scriptures, the more they reveal themselves as being true. Yet Jesus is standing right before them. In verse 39 it says, In the scriptures ye find our charter of, to eternal life. Go search them, and you will find that Jesus is to their testimony. And yet, he will not come to me for that eternal life which you profess to find there, of which you tell you I am the appointed dispenser. It's compared to Acts 17, 11. How touching and gracious are these words. Here are two points. The honor which Christ gives to the scriptures. He's not glorifying himself. He's glorifying the scriptures that he fulfills. As a record which is above all the right and bound to search. The reverse of which the church of the Romans taught. The opposite is extreme is this, is resting in the mere book without living in Christ to direct the soul to whom it is main use and chiefest glory. We may say, oh, I'm living by the book. I don't lie. Oh, I don't steal. Oh, really? You never lied. You never lied? Well, maybe I did lie. Well, then, then that makes you a liar, doesn't it? We don't like to say that, do we? We say that, well, and, and that's one of the Ten Commandments. You broke one of the laws. So you broke the law, and there has to be something paid for that. You're responsible for that. Well, I just, it was just a little, it, it's a lie. That makes you a liar. Have you ever stole anything? And you say, oh, no, I never stole it. Well, how would I believe that? You just told me you're a liar. So how can I tell whether or not you're telling the truth? Because you just, you're a liar. So, how do I believe the unstolen and everything? So we are responsible for the law. And God only gave us ten commandments. Man seemed to stick a whole bunch more on there through Moses. But God was actually asking us simply to keep ten. But everything else holds on to them ten. He honored them. Jesus honored the scriptures. He says, keep the word. Keep the scripture. Keep my father in the house. Verse 41, he says, I receive not honor from men. What he's doing here, he's not casting his own end on with theirs, which was to obtain human applause. Jesus didn't come here to be a rock star. Jesus didn't come here to have some great big movement to glorify himself. He came here to glorify the Father. Remember he said that. He says, I come to do the will of the Father, which will then glorify him. That's what Jesus' purpose was. It wasn't to glorify himself. In verse 42 it says, Not the love of God in you, oh, which would inspire you with a single desire to know his mind and will and yield yourselves to it in spite of prejudice and regardless of consequences. Now, that's the hard part when we follow the scriptures. There's consequences. You know, when you tell people you're a Christian, half your friendship list gets cut. Right away. Then when you start walking as a Christian, the other half of that starts to get diminished. Because people are convicted by that. They're convicted. I can't be like that. I don't think I can do that. Well, have you asked Jesus to help you? You can't do it on your own. He's willing to come in right now. He's alive. He's real. And all we have to do is passionately say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please help me. Come into my life. Correct me. Change me. That then becomes a witness and a testimony of the power of God in me. I could go on with a number of personal experiences how God has transformed my life. I'm not here to do that. To share all these stories about how God's changed my life. I'm here to tell you that each and every one of us, there's a witness that comes across us that will glorify God and point the way to him. It says in verse, as if another shall come, how strikingly that this has been verified in history of the Jews, according to Bengal, uh, quote, from the time of the true Christ of, to our time, 64 false Christs have been reckoned by whom they have been deceived. 
64 since Christ have come that people said, no, this is the one. This is the one. This is the one. And yet the one who was truly standing before them, they didn't see him. Didn't see him. Have you seen him? How can you believe? He's saying here, will not and cannot hear our different features of the same awful statement of the human heart. The human heart closes. God says, listen, you have been defiant against me. I have offered my branch of peace to you. And because you do not accept it, I will harden your heart. Is your heart hardened? Have you closed it out to God? I mean, are you really thinking that you can do all this on your own? Or are you humble enough to allow the Savior in and let him walk alongside with you? To have that full life. Can't do it on our own. We want to. That's a, I think that's an instinct inside of us that we want to be in control. I want it to go this way. And yet God's saying, no, I, I need you to go this way. And it may not be the direction that you're comfortable with. He says, do not think I will accuse you to the Father. He's stating here, my mission is not to collect evidence to condemn you at the Father's bar. He's not doing that. Jesus didn't come here to do that. He came here to redeem you. Moses' law is what condemns us. Not Jesus. Oh, that's why people have a hard time with this book. It's all oh, this book only talks about, oh, oh, God is angry with us. But the book speaks more about God's love than he does about his wrath. He just wants you to know that there's an evil path you walk and that there's a light that you can follow. Alas, that will be well done to it by another. And him, the object of all your religious boastings, Moses put here the law, the basis of the Old Testament scriptures. He wrote for me an important testimony to be the subject of the whole Pentateuch. And it's of me, Jesus is saying. This whole Pentateuch is speaking of me. He's speaking about a redeemer that was to come. He's telling the Pharisees, this scripture that you now so well memorize is all about me. And yet, you can't see. Can't see. Luke 16, 31 says, he says, but he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Remember that story? That is where Lazarus is in the grave, in Sheol. And he can see Abraham, and he's burning. He's burning. And he's, oh, if I could only touch the breast of Abraham and touch the cool waters. If I could only go back and tell my brothers and my sisters, they would then believe this God. Now Jesus is saying, you don't need that. If you don't believe Moses and you don't believe the prophets and all that's been unfolded before now, what more do you need? What more? A remarkable contrast, not absolutely exalting the Old Testament scripture above his own words, but putting to the office of those respected documents of the prepared Christ's way to the revelation, which was to corporate the letter of the Old Testament, was now displayed. Everything that God had spoken through the prophets written in their scriptures, was standing there, displaying all his glory. He raised the dead, he healed the sick. And he was offering them eternal life. And those who do not believe in this Jesus, they did not neglect the scriptures. Verse 39 points out to the well-known diligence among the Jews in studying the Torah. The trouble was in their belief that it, this itself was sufficient for salvation. Oh, I know the Bible. I know about this Jesus. That's enough. I'm a good person. Wrong answer. Wrong thought. The scriptures are not what gives you eternal life. It is only the blood of the cross that redeems us. And that is in the scriptures. 
But you have to believe that. This was equivalent to saying that they were spiritually dead. That's what Jesus was asking them. Do you want to live? Because right now, you're walking dead. I'm offering you free life. Free life, given freely to you. If only you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. He did not have the official sanction for his mission. The Jewish hearers entirely missed the sanction of God himself in this mission of Jesus. The reference to verse 42, that the love of God could mean people's love for God or God's love for people, or perhaps both. It is most likely that their lack of God for God is in the mind of the view of the context. This was their love. The love of the scriptures. In all of their study of the scriptures, they had missed the essential point. Jesus was direct in telling them that. And they did not believe what Moses had wrote. With all of their devotion to study the scriptures, they did not really believe what he said. It would have been difficult for devout Jews to grasp this distinction. But without it, they stood no chance of believing that the truth of what Jesus was saying. Today, even today, the Jews cannot accept that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He didn't fulfill all of the prophecies. He didn't pull up in a Mercedes or something. I don't know. Whatever it was. I have a dear friend in Israel. Some of you know him. Moni. And I sat there knowledgeable man of the scriptures, knowledgeable about Jewish tradition, knowledgeable about the history of mankind, and asked the question, is Jesus the, the Messiah? He said he didn't fulfill all the, didn't fulfill all the prophecies. Well, which one, Moni? Couldn't answer it. Couldn't answer it. He knew all the prophecies. And he knew all the ones. He even told us the ones, right? We stood there and he said, this is what he prophesied and he did it. And yet he said he didn't fulfill all of them. He knew the scriptures. And yet he wanted to add one in there to defend himself. that now he didn't have to be accountable to the scriptures. Because that's not the Messiah. Do you see how distorted this can be? If you don't read it with the spirit. I'm not saying not to read the scriptures in no way. But it's not the scripture. It is Jesus Christ that offers the eternal life. The scriptures only point to Jesus as the redeemer. John Wesley said once, quote, when I was young, I was sure of everything. Know any young people like that? In a few years after having been mistaken a thousand times, I was not half so sure of most things as I was before. At present, I am hardly sure of anything but what God has revealed to me. Where is that? Page one? Page 575? He's revealed it all here. He revealed it all to us before he came. Jesus knows that when we are left to our own thoughts, we will come up short every time. Do I get an amen with that one? Amen. That is why he tells us to head back to the scriptures. The scriptures is designed for us to objectively measure God's truth against man's truth. They call it apologetics. How can you prove that God is true against the world's truth? And the only way you can answer that question is in the scriptures. He answered all of them here. There isn't one question that cannot be answered here in the scriptures. And you seek them. Here's, here's the great part of all of it. You may say, you know something, I, I don't know my way around the Bible. I don't know all this stuff. I can't find it. I can tell you one thing. Scripture says that if you believe in Jesus Christ, he then allows the Holy Spirit to dwell within you. And guess what? The Spirit of God reveals the truth to you. It's there. But, Matthew 12, 30 says, Seek ye first. You've got to seek God. You've got to look for Him. It's right there. It's right here in this scripture. 
to be ours to be have. Psalm 119 verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. We don't know forever, do we? No, we don't. We may know 80. We may know 85. No, but we don't know forever. But he established it forever. The stars that are up in this heavens that my grandmother saw when she was 12 are still the same as the 12 year old today. They're established. They're fixed in place. Christ says, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. First Peter 1 Peter 1.25 says, The word of the Lord endureth forever. Have you ever been weak? Have you ever been tired? I mean, you went on one of those long, long walks or long road trips and it's just kind of like, I can't keep my eyes open. I am so tired. Have you been worried? Worn? Tired? It is only the scriptures through Christ that can strengthen us. He's always there. Always there. And yet, we don't want to believe that. We think he's like, he's kind of like, he's transcendent. He's way out there. That There's no way that God's knowing about my problem right now. I want to absorb my own problem. I don't want to give it to God. I can work this out. He's right there. He's right here. If you believe. My grandmother quoted this to me in a verse in Isaiah 48. The grass withereth. The flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. I mean, that's got to be reassuring. I would think. I would want to stick that on a wall somewhere so that is a re daily reminder. I mean, the flowers that we got in an array of our yard today in another month are going to be gone. And so will we. Be gone. But his word? There'll be someone standing here 50 years from now. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The same. And then going to be changed. Because there's a few students out there that know Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> and they make sure that the text is correct. You may be wrong, but Jesus says, search the scriptures. Want the answer? The answer is here. You may miss the point if Jesus is not the point. You might miss the point if he's not the point. How interestingly enough, Jesus knows that these men have searched and their search has led them to miss the whole point. What was happening here? The Pharisees think that their knowledge of the scriptures given them salvation. All of their memorization, everywhere I can point to exactly right here where this is all at, that is what saved me. I know the Bible. Jesus is not saying that at all. The point is knowing Jesus and receiving the revelation through him, and that is in verse 39. Jesus said to the Pharisees, what did he say to them in verse 45? He said to them, do you not think that I will accuse you before the Father? The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. They set their hope in Moses, not God. And he goes on to say, For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? We know of Jesus' love for the Old Scripture, the Old Testament. He obeyed it. He fulfilled it. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness and only by the word of God. But he also knows that if I do not find Jesus in the word, then we are missing the whole point. How is it possible for scripture readers to miss Jesus in the scriptures today? Let me give you a few names. And I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm being truthful. They miss the point. Judaism miss Jesus. The Church of the Latter-day Saints, a.k.a. known as Mormonism, missed the point. 
They know the scriptures. Some of them even change the scriptures. The religion of Islam missed the point. Allah is not God. Jehovah Witnesses missed the point. Jesus wasn't just a perfect man. He was the Son of God. Missed the point. All of these religions read the Old Testament, but they do not reach the same conclusion about Jesus Christ. You could argue with Mormons all day long. Jehovah Witnesses about Jesus. Oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Jesus himself said, many called upon me and did things in my name, and yet I did not know them. That should be sobering. For all those who say, oh yeah, I know Jesus. Okay. Really? Is he the same Jesus that I know? Is he the Jesus that is the Son of God? Is it the Jesus who walked on earth to redeem me? Is it the Jesus that mankind, through their sins, brutally scourged, beat, and killed him for our sins? Is it the Jesus that three days later arose from the grave? And lives today? Is it the Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15 that says over 500 witnesses saw him ascend into heaven? Scriptures are true. Believe me. Believe me, the scriptures are true because there have been many who have tried to disprove it. 500 witnesses is not mass hysteria, it's not an illusion. They witnessed the Son of God. Our nation, founding fathers, used the Old Testament in part to construct the world's greatest republic. But not all of them found a real relationship with Jesus Christ. They knew the scriptures. They said, this is the way we should be. This is the way we keep our way selves from tyranny. This is how we love one another. But yet, some of them truly were not Christians. All your friends may not agree with you on all the points concerning what the scriptures declare about Jesus. We get in debates about that. Right, Jim? Even in seminary, there are different views on theology and where God is taking us and where we're going. You know something? That's not important to me. I may not agree with all those points, but... Here's the key, the point. We must believe that Jesus is the only one who brings us back to a right relationship with the Almighty Father and Him alone. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, I do thank You that You love us so much that You would ask Your Son to go get Your children. That you would send him to be scourged and mocked, to be killed for my sin, for all our sins, for anyone who wanted to believe. Father, I thank you for your healing touch, that you touch and heal even those who don't even ask. You truly are, Father, a glorious God. And I would ask that those who are hearing that those who are here right now, if they haven't made that commitment to you, if they haven't accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, I would ask that stirring in their heart right now, that they would ask Jesus in and confess that they are weak, that they are a sinner and need to be redeemed. Father, I ask for a healing touch. I ask, Father, that you'd keep us in your word and that we would be a light and we would be a testimony and a witness that Jesus is truly Son of God and Jesus is in my heart and Jesus lives forevermore. And one day, one day soon, we'll all be there in His heavenly kingdom and we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.